Welcome back to the Discovering Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Our guest today is Eric Adin. Eric Adin is a principal and the director of Tri-State Investment Sales Operations in Avis and Young's New York City office, where he leads and coordinates day-to-day execution for the three dozen member group. Eric has been involved in developing and executing all facets of the investment sales business across all asset types in the Tri-State region. His oversight includes underwriting and analytics, marketing, technology, market research, business development strategy and sales management, as well as managing the P&L, human resources, and training. In addition to that, he serves in the executive community and in several steering roles for the National uh, Capital Markets Initiatives. He has been involved in over $4.5 billion of real estate transactions during his 10-year career. Before joining Avis and Young, Eric was a financial analyst on CBRE's New York Institutional Investment Sales Division, which is a top 10 globally ranked team. Eric earned a Bachelor of Science degree in finance from the University of Connecticut with a concentration in real estate and was a 2019 recipient of the Yukon Real Estate Center Early Career Alumni Award. In addition to this, he serves as the co-chair on the management committee of REAL, an exclusive New York-based networking and educational association. Eric is also a member of REBNY, ULI, and Property IDX Leadership Board. Eric, it's a pleasure having you on. Really appreciate you for wow, doing this. Wow, what, what an introduction. <laughs> I, I, I know that uh, that comes probably off our website, but it sounds like I do a lot more than I actually do. Right. Um, I've been fortunate to wear a lot of different hats in, in a 10-year career, and uh, we can get into what led me down those paths. Yep. But, um, but before, that, before we do that, let's get a rundown of kind of what your background is. So where are you from, and why did you get into the industry in the first place? Sure. Uh, from a small town called Wallingford, Connecticut. It's about 15 minutes north of New Haven, Connecticut. So for those that ever make their way up that way, it's where Merritt Parkway runs into 95. Uh, One of six kids. So family's always been a huge part of my life. Uh, My parents are awesome and uh, both happen to be in real estate. Although that really wasn't part of my real estate story or my real estate journey. It's one of those things that when I tell people that they say, well, of course you're in real estate. And in reality, it didn't have much of an effect. My mom, um, didn't work when I was younger. And then I think, you know, probably when I middle school or just got into high school, she became a realtor and my father's a real estate attorney. Uh, so they actually work together sometimes on transactions. Um, my real estate journey really began when I got, uh, into Yukon and, uh, I was waitlist by the way. So really got in by the, the skin of my teeth. I had committed to Suffolk in Boston. And then at the last minute got into Yukon. I said, that sounds like a lot more fun. Let's do that. Uh, even though I still love Boston. Um, anyway, so in the business school at UConn, I was general management major. And looking back, I don't even know what that means. Like, I don't know what right. you just go to school to manage. What are yeah. you managing? <laughs> you don't have any skill set, uh, which as a manager now, having earned a skill set over a long period of time, uh, looking back, I'm glad that I made that that switch. And so for me, it's uh, the switch came uh, free pizza you know, struggling college kid. And my roommate at the time, who was an overachiever in the in the academic sense, said, why don't you just come to this real estate meeting? There's some good people there. And most importantly, there's free pizza. So I showed up to that meeting and they had a really impressive speaker. I, I want to say he was from Cornerstone or something. And the people were all really nice and different than the securities and the abstract math that you get in a lot of the finance classes. Mm. And I know a lot of people say this, it really was the tangibility that stuck right. to me. And I said, okay, these are good people. This is a, a career that I can understand, an asset class that I understand. And so starting starting then, halfway through my career at UConn, went full full bore into UConn, uh, sorry, into real estate. And it's that's kind of what really led me into it. Um, so right out of UConn, I got recruited by CBRE. They came and did a recruiting day. Mm-hmm. I happened to make the second round cuts, make it down to their office, and that's how I landed my first job. So um, my career start into real estate really doesn't sound that intentional. It was a lot of luck. And I think even along the way, there's been a lot of luck, but it's uh, maybe just being in the right place at the right time. Got it. And as far as where you you developed your business sense, besides school, where did you kind of learn the different aspects of business and develop this kind of um, sense for business? You know, I think I'm still learning that. it's not like, I don't think I was the kid at 10 years old who was creating these businesses and selling, you know, you hear all about these entrepreneurs right. who just knew from a young age that they were entrepreneurial. Right. And I don't know if I just didn't have the exposure or the creativity, but mm-hmm. it wasn't something that I think was innate in me and more so perhaps it was an exposure thing as well. Um, but over time, as I've been exposed to more aspects of business and really run our team like its own business, 
uh, you get to see that side of it. And so it's something that I've really fallen in love with because there's obviously the sales side of the things that we do, which right. is very transactional in nature. But if you're just looking at the next transaction, you're not really thinking about the business needs, goals, human resources, uh, the technologies, all of those things that go into creating a, a lasting business these days. Of course, so yeah. I don't know where it came from, but I'm, I'm glad that I've had enough experience now to, to have a good sense of it. Got it. Um, and so why commercial real estate? Um, you clearly have strong uh, general business and, and uh, sense. Would you, so you'd be successful in, in any field, but why um, CRE? What dr dr draws you into it? Uh, I like that you say I'd be successful in any field. I don't. I don't know about that. Um, perhaps with enough um, hard work and you know perseverance, perseverance, yeah. putting putting your mind to it. Yeah, sure. I think there's there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, for me, like I'd said, I think the, the tangibility of it made it very digestible for mm -hmm. me. Uh, I actually like that it's finite. Right. Um, so, for example, New York City has 287,000 individual block and lots. Right. Of them, about 120,000 are probably commercial grade. And of them, probably 20 to 30,000 are going to be valued over, say, $10 million. Right. So that's that's clear yeah. to me. Okay, so where can we do business? Well, here's 30,000 lots that we should probably be targeting because that's where business is. And yeah. I really like that ability to have a good grasp on it and, and be able to scale that. Great. And so what do you think you'd be doing career-wise if not commercial real estate? Mm. Oh, that is interesting. Um, my family tells me all the time that they're surprised I'm not in uh, like physical therapy or some okay. health-related field, not because I have much of a medical mind or would want to go through med school, but more so out of necessity. So mm. <laughs> this is just more so on the personal side. I've, I've had shoulder surgery, knee surgery, back surgery, wow. um, a number of just things that have happened to me over the years. And, you know, I've always been a pretty good athlete and maybe not so nice to my body going, bringing it to the the brink of, of breaking, really. Right. And so as I've gotten older and needed to learn some of these lessons the hard way, I've become really, uh, really dialed in on what makes your body work well. Right. And so I dove into nutrition and the physical therapy side of things, what makes your body move correctly. It's fully integrated. There's this great model called a tensegrity. So if you're building a building, it's brick over brick right. over brick. And a tensegrity is actually a web of like, think of elastic bands. And the only way that they can stand up is through their mutual equal tension. So mm. if you go ahead and tweak one side of it, if you pull it too tight, it stresses the exact opposite side. The same way, way is if you have a collapsed arch in your right foot, it might symptomize in your left hip. And so th these are things that, unfortunately, sitting in a desk for many years have exacerbated. Right. Uh, and so I'm always trying to undo those things. And I think the last bit of that, and this is still within the health field, is I had um, I was diagnosed with adult onset asthma a couple mm. years ago. And for somebody who wakes up at 5 a.m. to work out every day, pretty much religiously, like how can I be getting more unfit? Why am I having breathing problems? And I realized because of stress that I'd been mouth breathing a lot. Mm. And that by doing that, you actually hold on to a lot of stress and it makes your lungs not function mm. the way that they're supposed to. So uh, now I've trained myself to breathe through my nose and I'm very intentional about those things. So um, probably breathing through my, my mouth right now as I say that just right. because, but um, yeah, so something in the, in the medical field, I guess, or, you know, I'm also a musician, so I'd love to be a guitarist for someone, but uh, that's probably not great. in the cards either. Okay, great. Um, and you mentioned you have a routine where you wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to work out. Do you think this helps you in business as well, where you kind of stick to a schedule and stay disciplined every, every morning? Yes, that is without a doubt one of the foundational building blocks of what makes me tick. Mm. I love going on vacation, but like day three, day four of waking up at late at eight o'clock right. and having a cocktail on the beach, I'm like, you know, I wish I woke up today and had some regiment and yeah. some things to do. So yeah, I get up, my routine is I get up um, 4.45 to five every day. I go pretty much right to the gym and I have a new wrinkle in my life, which is I have a 10 month old daughter. So mm. the that free time that I used to have in the morning is Not now even anymore. less so. Yeah. So I got to get everything done by say 6.30, 6.45. And that's my really sacred me time, right? Mm. So I'm up, I am I usually don't work out with headphones on because I find it, it doubles as meditation mm. as well. So I'm not having those inputs and I'm running or I'm lifting weights and I'm solely focused on the activity and it doesn't leave space 
to ponder on things that are giving me anxiety. I can just be in the moment and it's right. like a flow state, which I really enjoy. So it clears my mind. I feel good. I'm meditated. I'm ready to go for the day. Then my daughter gets up at 630 with a dirty diaper and, you know, life slaps you right. in the face and you're ready to go. Uh, spend an hour with her and then I'm usually off to the office by 7.30 or so at the Great. latest. Yeah. So it's important you get into the rhythm in the morning so that you're set for the whole day. Yeah, and I think it's a skill set that's transferable. So there's a book that a lot of people know about, Atomic Habits, Atomic Habits right? Yeah. So I think everybody should read that book. Yeah. And it's all about making small incremental change to realize great results yeah. later on. And a couple of sayings that have really stuck with me is... Uh, every action that you take is a vote for the type of person that you want to be. Right. Right. And to take that a step further, if you, if you connect your identity with the things that you do, it makes them a lot stronger. Mm. So if you say, I'm the type of person who, when confronted with a decision of the easy way out or the, or the right thing, I'll always do the right thing. If you're the person that says, I don't negotiate with myself. I always wake up at 5 a.m. Right. I do that. You know, Jocko Willick says discipline sets you free. Yep. I believe in these things because I realize as you take some of the chaos out of your life, structurally, it just allows more freedom in the other areas to be more creative and 100%. to, you know, really feel more of life in those times in between the things that you've scheduled. Right. So you think by enacting these habits uh, very consistently, you can change the chatter that's going on in your head and believe in yourself more and become a completely different person. Absolutely. And I think it's something that um, perhaps to some people it comes easy. Mm. I have continually leveled up on a personal sense that has tra like transferred over into a mm. business sense for the last decade. Great. And I came out of school with terrible habits, didn't really care about my nutrition, always partying with my friends, didn't really care what time I got to bed. Now everybody makes fun of me. They're like, oh, 8.30, probably too late to call Eric. He's probably winding down for bed because I know, you know, under eight hours, you start to lose a little bit of IQ. Yeah. Under seven hours, you lose 30% of your yeah. IQ. So I'm not out here to be a hero. I mm -hmm. want to live life every day and enjoy it. And I want to be functioning at a high level. And so that means I need to get my sleep. I need to get my exercise routine in. I need to have my family time. And now I'm trying to jam in as much effective work time as I possibly can. Because I'm not trying to work the most hours. I'm trying to have the most Efficient. results. Yeah, got it. Understood. Um, so let's change the conversation to talk more about um, brokerage and how people can become successful brokers. So before you joined Avis & Young, you worked as an analyst on CBRE's uh, New York Institutional Investment Sales Group, which is top 10 globally ranked team. Do you think a broker should start out like you did as an analyst and then move into origination or start out directly in origination? There's levels to everything. And I think there's personalities that fit better with certain roles mm. than other roles. And that doesn't necessarily mean that necessarily mean that a particular role, like a broker, can only be a particular personality. Right. Because um, if you and I are both loudspeakers and very dominant, perhaps we'll clash. Right. And whereas if I'm more passive and you're a very assertive type person, you might actually find it easier to talk to me because I'm a better listener and I'm more receptive. And when I give feedback to you, it's slower and thoughtful, and then you can take it and do it with you, what you will. Right. So I think going back to the original question, you can probably have a moderate level of success, mostly by luck, mm. without having a great foundational background. Mm. So we've had people that I know of who have awesome family connections and they'll have a uncle hand them a deal and that person will then take the deal and essentially feed it to the team who will execute it to right. them. So that person's going to get paid pretty well just for knowing that person. Is that a reliable business plan? Probably not. No. While networks matter, at some point you're going to run into a situation where your expertise is going to matter more. Mm. And that's where starting with the fundamentals makes all the difference. So I don't know that it has to be a analyst program, but that's probably the most likely and easiest path. I'm sure there's a lot of self-study that you could do. Um, while I, and I know you're in a, an advanced program right now, when you're in getting your master's degree in those advanced programs, I think those are great for the network. Right. But whenever there's an answer at the end of the book, 
you're probably going to be missing something. And that's why most of the best learning comes on the job right. because there's no answer at the end of the day. It's what are your assumptions? How did you come up with them? And how are you going to defend them so that whatever answer you've come up with is the most justifiable? And that's, you know, I find that some of the hardest selling that we have is really just selling the sale, the owners, the sellers of the building on why pricing is what it right. is. And right now, especially in this market, it's a very difficult time to see pricing having dropped at the very lowest end, 10%, and you know, at the highest end, maybe 40%. Yeah. Right? That's a pretty wide range, but lots of asset classes yeah. and, and uh, risk profiles bundled in there. So if you were to look at a BOV that we did for them in January of last year, and we're showing them a 25% discount yeah. off that, that's a tough pill to swallow, right? And so you say, well, what are your selling skills that relate to that? that you're not walking in there trying to schmooze anybody. You're trying to be empathetic and educational to that person so that they understand there are macro factors that have changed the way that um, their buildings can pencil out for investors. Right. And so um, this was the question still about uh, the analyst program, I right. think, right? And so sure, there's lots of shops that'll give you a desk, a phone, a territory, start hammering the phones, call block by block, building by building. Um, it's a great way to gain a ton of market share but as you start to level up, you start to think, well, investors don't just buy on their singular block. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want some capital that travels and lots of capital structured around assets. So maybe we should focus on multifamily and right. then we'll focus on retail and right. we'll, we'll, we'll interact in those verticals. Um, and then you level up and you talk less even about the assets and you talk about buckets of capital amongst institutions and maybe they have a, a close end fund and you're trying to just liquidate and it's matches up perfectly with somebody who's trying to play. So there's different levels to all these games and there's places for a lot of people. But I think if you want to build long term success for yourself, nothing replaces really understanding the rows and the columns. Mm, understood. And this this skill set of being able to break down to an owner. How, how, what something really is worth. What do you think that comes down to? Is it just having strong market knowledge and being able to convey that to the owner? Yeah, no, market knowledge is a funny thing right now because um, comps are always heralded as one of the best markers of value. Yeah. And a real estate transaction, throwing out a, a rough number here, just say from when the time it's inked, meaning you signed a contract to the time it closes, let's just say it's 60 days. Okay? So that means... 60 days ago, have we had two now 75 basis point yeah, increases two. in the in the Fed rate, which isn't a direct correlate to the ind indices, but you know we've also seen what's yeah. happened with the tenure. Um, so are those comps really great indicators anymore of what today is? And if the Fed say they're going to continue this pressure and on the market, is that going to be a great indicator for where it's going to be in two, three months mm -hmm. after a marketing process and a contract period? Mm -hmm. It's really hard. And so... Uh, I like to bring humility into the conversation and say, this is where things have trended. This is our best guess on where they're going. We're falling somewhere with it within this range. Our pricing is less, it's going to be less precise now than it's ever been. Mm. And because I want to partner with, with owners and tell them this is what we're collectively up against, right. rather than saying, promising some high number and then beating them down over time. Like that's just, it doesn't end up with a good relationship. And so I think... Back to the question about, you know, what are the selling skills? Yeah. Communication is the number one selling skill. How effectively can you communicate what you know, what you think, what, you know, what you're feeling about a certain mm. process or an asset or the market in general? And how can you have that be digested to that person who might have a, a sensitive reaction to it because yeah. it's serious implications for them, right? You might fail at a marketing process. You, you didn't make money, but you didn't technically lose money. You lost time, right? that person could potentially lose a lot of money. So it's a sensitive topic in today's market. And that's why I think always, you know, having integrity and communicating well with, with your sellers and with the investors that you deal with on the other side is makes all the difference. Because I think, uh, I don't know who says this, but um, you're always judged by what you do in the toughest times, right? right? So how did you act when the market went sideways yep. and you were trying to be slimy in some way? Like, we're not going to forget 2008, yeah, what you did then in 2009, right? We're, we're not going to forget that. And same, same thing right now. There are reputations being made in this difficult market. And as somebody who isn't here to retire next year, yep. 
even if I had the best year ever, I'm not not walking away. Um, I did play Powerball when it was $2 billion, but that was just, uh, you know, <laughs> <Separate>. <laughs> you, you got to shoot your shot. Right. Um, so you got to play the long game. Got it. And how much of investment sales brokerage comes down to understanding people and how much of it comes down to understanding the asset? Would you say it's a 50-50 even mix between these two things that makes a good broker? That's a really good question. Um, I guess I guess 50-50 is the answer with this additional color in that looking at either of them mutually exclusively mm would be the incorrect way to do it. So you, okay. so so they are part of the same dynamic. Right. And that if you don't have expertise on the asset side, but you might know the person really well and be able to communicate to them, I don't know what value you're going to be able to add to them because all you are is a maybe a friend at that point. Right. And if you're somebody who has great real estate knowledge but aren't understanding what the needs of that person are, you might you might have the best solution for investor A, but if it doesn't fit the needs of investor B, right. it doesn't matter how hard you push, it's just not what they need right so now. So they work together, the two. Yeah, the two of them, yeah. And so I think expertise well communicated mm -hmm. to a person is really the mix that you want. And I, and I think in times it's the communication side that matters more and other times the expertise and the asset that, that'll matter more. But knowing when to pull those levers and how to intertwine them is really going to be the key. Understood. And how did you learn the skills associated with being a leader? Um, is this something you were born with or did you develop this as you went through your career? Also another good one. Um, hmm. So I think I am a natural leader, but I don't think all leader, leaders are natural. Right. Um, so when I think of leadership at a young age, oftentimes it's, I don't know, the best athlete on the team who just happens to take on the role. Right. Maybe they're the loudest voice in the locker room. I happen to fit a lot of those archetypes. But the leadership qualities that I've gained over the past 10 years really are, they don't matter. They don't, sorry, they are different than those ones that I Naturally. happened to have right. growing up. Now it's much more about... Um, you know, inspiring the team mm. to continue towards the mutual goal, but having the communication skills, the empathy, I, I keep using these words because they really matter on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis, um, to understand the individualities of your entire team. I have a team that's of a scale where I can do that. Maybe if I had 300 people, I couldn't do that for everybody, right. but with, you know, 30 people, that's something that I can know every person pretty well, attention. understand what their skills are. Right. And when you try to put everybody into the same box, it's just not going to work well. I have people that work for me that need to sit down in a chair next to me and we'll sit and we'll talk for an hour, but we only have to do it once a month and they'll do a full download mm. and I'll give them some feedback. Mm. There are other people who, very short, two bullets in an email. Hey, why did this happen? Why right. did that happen? And I'll send back two bullets. This happened because of that right. and this happened because of that. And so knowing the way that people best give and receive mm. information and feedback is the best thing that I think you can do as a manager. Um, and, and as a leader, you know, you have to be willing to do all of the things that you're asking of, of people. So I said, I don't want to work the most hours, but I'm in the office pretty early. And right. there were times and I, there are seasons to life where it was 12 or 13 hours a day in the office, plus a couple hours at home, plus every weekend. Mm. And when we were really building out our team, that's what it required of me. We were successful in building out good systems, hiring good, strong people to help us move these systems mm -hmm. along. And now it, the maintenance phase on that side of the business requires much, much less work for me, which gives me the time and the freedom to be able to work on more transactions, right. more sales management, more technology initiatives, whatever it might be that right. fills in the, the space in between. Got it. And in times like these where you mentioned that you there were times where you're working 12 hours a day nonstop. How do you balance your family and personal life and provide for your family while also kind of putting your career first? Not first, but putting your career in an important position. Um, I'll never put anything above my family. Right. I'm that kind of guy. Right. Um, so I do set boundaries. Um, but I also know that the work is what enables me to live a good life with my mm -hmm. family. And so our, our U.S. president, Juan Bueno, uh, 
president of Avis and Young, obviously not of the, right, yeah. of the United, <laughs> the States. United States. You're like, wait a second, that name doesn't <laughs> sound, I thought it was this Joe guy. Um, he talks about this thing uh, in like cheap time versus expensive time. So for him, he tries to, if he has to work a lot on a weekend, he's going to get up at 6 a.m. and work from 6 to 9 a.m. because his kids are teenagers and they're mm -hmm. going to sleep to 10 o'clock anyway. Mm -hmm. So he didn't actually miss any family time. Right. He just fit it in a time that worked well. But when he has to go to their sports games at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, right. like that's pretty expensive. But lots of times he's still going to spend that time of showing up for them. And so I really liked the way that he put that because I'm going to try to be there for everything that I can be. You know, I was very fortunate to have a father that coached every single sports team mm -hmm. I was on that was outside of school and did it for all six of wow. my siblings. So like that example for me, there's nothing that can replace that. And I want to be able to do that for my daughter and hopefully have more kids. And so that means I need to be very intentional mm. with my time and don't, don't, don't screw around with it. Mm. So when I need to be working hard, hopefully it's times when, you know, my daughter's with my mother-in-law babysitting right. her and my wife's at work, but when I'm home, I'm home. And so I'm not checking my emails and I'm being right. fully present when I'm there so I can really be, you know, live that part of my life to its fullest as well. So I think there's there's times and places it's not always going to be easy to be all one thing, all the other. Um, and so I think if, you, if, it's, if you're conscious about it mm. is the most, like, it's the great first step. Right. Because then at least you can start to act with intention. Right. 100%. Um, you mentioned in the LinkedIn post uh, that leaders are usually in their position for a reason, meaning that they did something right along the way uh, to have the experience and expertise to hold the position. Let's say someone watching this is not naturally a leader. How can they develop themselves to become the type of person who can hold this position? I do remember typing that. Um, so back to my management degree at UConn, mm -hmm. I didn't really have any expertise to impart on anybody, mm. expertise or experience for that matter. So I think part of this equation is going to be pure time, right. patience. Right. Don't expect to graduate from school and be like, all right, I'm the new CEO in town. Like everybody get out of yeah. my way. No. But what you can do is you can try to speed up your experience. And so something that I've done for my whole career, I would say, or at least once I started being more conscious mm -hmm. of it, once I started growing into these better habits, is when something new comes up and it might require extra work, but it's going to be a good learning experience, mm -hmm. you raise your hand. I'll do it. I'll take it on. Let me figure that out. And that's why when you're reading my intro, it's got analytics and marketing and technology right. and sales man, all of these different things. Most brokers' resume is like, Broker sells buildings, yeah. right? And so my role isn't for everybody. Um, I don't know if I would be the super happiest just to be a sole broker either. So find your lane and, and figure out what it is. But the more experience and exposure to different sides of the business that you can get, I think will help you have a more valuable opinion right. to be able to give to people. As you utilize that opinion and create that value, I think you'll naturally be put in places of leadership, whether that comes with a title or whether that's just people want you to be in the room with them. They say, hey, we got this big client coming in. Mm -hmm. I know that you did this research on how the metaverse is changing tech, you know, changing real estate moving forward. And you went to that seminar and the cannabis industry. Right. They're trying to invest in those things. So why don't you come sit at the table? Because you took the time to go be an expert in two niche areas of the market. And now you're somebody that they can count on because they're like, I sell buildings. I don't, I don't right, want to learn yeah. about these tangen tangential things in the market. So figure out the things that you're generally interested in and become an expert in them. Mm -hmm. Slowly start to branch out. Those might be contradictory, but um, I think breadth of experience definitely lends itself to being able to add a, a lot of value. Great. And what's the learning curve in commercial brokerage? How long does it take for a broker to really get it and be able to originate and close their own deals? Um... I think the traditional model says two years, 18 months to two and a half years, mm -hmm. probably. Um, I think the biggest caveat, the biggest implicator in this is with whom you're doing it, where you're doing it. Mm. So not sure this is the best example, but you know, my sister's a realtor in Nashville, 
Tennessee, which, you know, you, homes flying off the shelf right. for $100,000 more than their asking price. She got into the industry two or three years ago and was crushing it four months later. Mm. You know what I mean? So less sophisticated than commercial real estate, sure. But if you're standing in front of that moving train and it's full of cash, course, like it's yeah. going to be hard to miss. So market matters in placement and timing. But I think really for this question, what matters more is going to be the team that you work mm. on. So um, sure, there's CBRE and JLL and Avison Young and Marcus Milicic, all these different flags, we'll call right. them. But within those, there is lots of teams. Of course. And all teams are not created equal. You could be on two different investment sales teams within Avis and Young. You could be at mine in New York and we're one singular team in New York, or you could be the one in Florida and the one in, you know, California. Right. You're going to get a slightly different experience. And so our team in particular, we are a unified team, 30 people. And so what it does is it allows a higher level of collaboration which we feel helps our people get up to speed faster. Mm. So you're going to be put on a high number of transactions. And we do something called a stand-up meeting every single morning at 9 mm. o'clock. And we do multifamily Monday, retail Tuesday, development Wednesday, right? So we go asset class by asset class. And we go through the entire pipeline of those asset mm. classes. We talk about why somebody, you know, what is the, you know, three to five strong points on this? What are the three or five strong objections? Why people can't make this pencil? And we talk about what types of investors would actually want to look at that. So one, that's helping us transact our properties, but it's also helping all the young people in the room learn about, of course. oh, that's why 2A, 2B matters. That's, oh, tax, tax class protected assets in an environment where there's budget concerns in the city and taxes are moving. That's very important. Development site with 421A footings in, oh, that's really important because right. that you can't get that anymore. So that's going to be priced at a premium. So there's these little things that if you just give a broker a desk and a phone and yeah. you say, good luck, I don't know if they make any money, mm. 18 months, two years, five years. It takes a certain type of person to take that kind of beating. So I like that we offer close mentoring, mm. teaming. So you work with three, three to five people on this listing and a different three to five people on a different listing. So you can see how they communicate yep. and you can see how they work together. And it gives you a lot of experience in a shorter shorter period of right. time, which I think is a good thing about, I do a ton of mentoring and um, speaking with young young professionals. And they're always like, well, do I go into acquisitions? Do I go to brokerage? Do I go to the debt side? And there's really no right answer. What I will say about brokerage and in a high, high velocity brokerage shop is, you know, we're doing 500 and I don't know, just say 500 BOVs this year. Mm -hmm. And so that is a lot of underwriting, market research, understanding assets. It's a lot of reps, Yep. okay? And so you're going to get a huge breadth of experience. Yep. Now, are you going to have any asset management experience in this role? No, you will have no idea how to use Yardy Matrix. I'm right. sorry, that's not what you're going to get here. But if you're looking to just get a breadth of experience, a lot of reps very quickly, right. I don't think there's a better environment for it. Right. Um, and then if you realize somebody that you're a cradle to grave type person, go work for an owner who mm. you're going to acquire, you're going to do the value add program, you're going to see it through asset management and disposition. Right. So you need to think about what parts of the business most interest you and perhaps what are best suited for your skill sets. Great. And so you think for a young broker, it's important to be humble enough to put your ego aside and let somebody kind of walk you through what to do and what not to do and get the reps in to fully get the full experience of learning the whole business. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have a young broker that works for us and he has been primarily in the multifamily asset mm. class. And he was called by somebody who owns a pretty substantial uh, development site. Mm -hmm. And so he has two options. He brought in this BOV and he can either hand it over to an analyst to go do the underwriting or he can work on it himself. Yep. And he came to me, he's like, I really want to learn this. And so I'm going to take a first shot at it. And I said, that's awesome. Great. And then when you're done, come in here and let's go line by line and talk about every single input in this model, why it matters, how it's different than last year and where it could be yep. heading. So somebody with a mindset that they want to understand more is always going to end up further along mm. than somebody who's like, oh, I got what I need. Like, I just need to keep going. So right. it, it's somebody who's continually curious and wants to improve on their skill set. Um, that is going to be around for the long term because things change too. Like yep. it's not like you can know everything in real estate. 
because whatever you knew in 2019 in the first half, guess what? It changed in the second half when they did the 2019 housing laws. Yeah. So now you need to learn some more. So unless you really like learning and digging into the new set of regulations and tax code and zoning code and all these different things that are always changing, I, I think that's what actually finds what, what I find interesting mm -hmm. about it is that there is no finality to expertise. It's an evolving, ongoing Always, yeah. endeavor. And to that end, I think if you can be curious and that's something you like, it's just going to be a, a, a much better skill set than Great. somebody who's just looking to get to the end. Amazing. Um, what have you learned about yourself since you've closed your first deal? Um... It's a good question. I, I've, let's see. I think I have a couple different things that are coming to mind there. Um, first, I tend to feel feelings pretty intensely. Mm. I'm a pretty emotional person, um, which is good and bad. It means that I can be a caring and empathetic person, yeah. but when things go sideways, like I'm probably staying up that night thinking about it, of course, uh, which isn't great. And so. I talked about my workout practice and which is kind of coupled with a meditation. I'm working on it. Mm. You know, I would love to be a little bit more immune to the external things that can really affect somebody's state of mind. Mm. Um, so that's one. And then the second one is uh, after a certain point, I don't think you're going to be I don't think people are motivated by money unless it's more of like a scoreboard. Right. Right. And so uh, I'm glad that I'm not. I don't. I'm not trying to do this to be the richest person. Right. You know, I'm here to obviously make money, but uh, I also value the relationships and I value the asset class and find it something that's pretty rewarding and fun to do. 100%. And how has the world of investment sales changed since you started? Um, what worked for a broker 11 years ago, does that still work today? I think we're moving towards more perfect information, Okay. which is probably the biggest change. So, you know, my partner, James Nelson, he was a partner at Massey Knackle, mm. which had an absolute killer system, right. right? Just put somebody every five or 10 blocks or whatever it is, and they owned the information. They owned so much information. Granted, they're not selling Empire State Building and buildings of that caliber, but, you know, a lot of $5 million deals sure does pay the, pay the bills, yeah, right? Course. And so today there's so much publicly available information that brokers pretty much all have the same information, right? right? So it, it comes from public sources most of the time and it takes that next level of vetting, right. extra legwork. So we, for our, every time a building trades, we're calling the buyer seller. Mm. And if we're not the broker on it, right. we're calling the broker and just what happened here? How'd it go? What was the cap rate? They'll never share though. They'll give us, you'll get two different cap rates yeah. from the buyer or the seller. Um, because really understanding the story behind certain assets and why it priced adds that extra color and the right. value rather than you could just be the broker that said, oh, your building sold next to the, your neighbor sold for $300 a square foot. Do you want to sell? Cause that's what I'll get for you. And like that worked for a long time. Right. And now you just need to bring more to the table. And also in New York, every time a mom and pop seller sells, that's a consolidation, right? And so there's going to be fewer owners in the city likely every year from here on out mm. as, I mean, look at Carlisle buying 500 right. whatever buildings in Brooklyn, yeah. right? There's a consolidation of ownership, which means that older styles of business are gonna be less effective. Mm. And as we were talking about leveling up, the moving capital side of investment sales is going to be much more uh, impactful because you can just do a lot more with, you know, a relationship right. rather than 500 individual bu Got it. buildings. So you mentioned that everybody has access to this public info, but the brokers that have access to this private info or go out there and get that access are the ones that really stand out. I, yeah, I believe so. Because, I mean, New York City has Acris and NYC right. open data. Like, there's a lot of great information yeah. that actually I think a lot of people don't even utilize because they're afraid of, yeah. you know, numbers and APIs. But um, it, a lot of it's there for the taking. Um, but I do think going the extra leg to learn, right, because right, you can just look at price per square foot and whatever yeah. the other metrics you want to hone in on. But I think understanding the story behind each asset and trying to unwind that is really how you can add value and create those um, those proxies. Great. Amazing. And why do you think 
it's important as a broker to have a strong personal brand. And have you generated new business by putting yourself kind of out there publicly? Hmm. That's something that's top of mind for me right yeah. now. Um, so I do think that it's becoming more important mm. than ever to have a personal brand. I do think that there's always been personal branding before uh, LinkedIn and all that other stuff. If you see uh, like my partner, James, just call on him again, like he's always in a suit and a tie. Right. My other partner, Brandon, he's always in a blue suit and a white shirt and brown loafers. Like without fail. I got a little bit more pizzazz. I happen to be wearing something <laughs> lower key today, yeah, but yeah. it's usually like window pane or, you know, check or something like that. And so that's like a small element of your personal brand. But is your personal brand also the person that responds to your emails at 4 a.m. and 2 a.m. and 10 p.m. and one in the afternoon? Right. Like, wow, this guy's super responsive. How is that possible? That's not my brand because I draw those boundaries exactly. with my family, yeah. right? And so, and I'm usually sleeping by 10 p.m., so right. I, I can't be that guy either. Um, so it's, uh, there's a lot of small factors that play into that. But, you know, for example, I'll put it out there. Something that I like to do is I like to teach, right? Mm. And so part of my personal brand is tr I'll teach classes for Rebney on continuing education, those mm. types of things. But I also do a ton of one-on-one -on -one training with people who are young and teach them what a cash on cash is, what negative right. leverage is and why that matters and what it's going to mean moving forward. So, um, so hopefully I can follow through on that. I'm putting it out there right now. <laughs> I'm going to do more teaching. Great. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, let's say someone watching this right now is working in acquisitions. What are some aspects of a building that needs to be understood beyond the numbers? Oh, interesting. Um, I guess the easy answers here would be, um, you know, first thing that comes to mind here. Uh, well, actually, the first thing that came to mind here was just like the quality of the finishes in like right. a multifamily building. So... Um, I was recently at a retreat and um, one of the founders of Peak Capital, David Gomez, was there. And the question posed to him, you know, what do you find most rewarding about, about this, being a, a real estate owner? Yeah. And he's like, the design element. Because when I design an apartment, there is the, the, the renovation in the kitchen and mm -hmm. the living room that costs $50,000. Yeah. That looks pretty good. And then there's the one that's $55,000 where you can move the outlets to more convenient places and you leave room for a coat rack near the right. door. And you start to think about what it's like to live in that apartment and not just to be, you know, another number. And what ends up happening is you get stickier tenants mm. because they actually enjoy the quality of life that you're creating for them. And so I think thinking about how the physical world creates an experience for people yeah. is hugely important besides just the numbers. All apartments are not created. All office space is clearly not created right. equal in this market. Of you course. know, when we talk about A's and B's and yeah. dila dilapidated mid-block buildings that right. we need a tax break for to be able to convert them to residential yeah. buildings. So, yeah, understanding the bricks that you're actually dealing with is is hugely important. And I think, you know, this brings up a good a good point, which is, um, analysts understand your rows and columns, but understand the whys mm -hmm. and understand the, the actual bricks and does it make sense? You know, I, I would hate to see, you know, an analyst underwrite a conversion of an office building to residential and them not understand that you, the floor plates are too mm -hmm. deep and you can't actually even fit an apartment in there. Right. And so, well, oh, that's an architect's job. Well, why can't that be your job? Why can't you understand that? Everything, yeah. You know what I mean? So understanding all those different facets are are what I think what's make this interesting. And it and as an asset class, what's great about real estate is it is hands-on and you actually do have some ability to create value. Like I can go buy stock at Amazon, but I can't change what it. What am I gonna write a yeah. hundred letters to yeah. the new CEO? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> what is that gonna do? It's right. not gonna I, I can't do anything. Yeah. Um but if I bought a building, I could absolutely make change there right. to increase the value, which is really a good, a good, you know, point of information for where we are in this market. Of course, which is there's real estate investing and there's real estate speculating, and for a long time it's let's buy this building, we'll do some minimal renovations, cap rates are always going to go down, we're going to refi out all of our capital, we're going to be ticking right. off. Now it's much more conservative, but there's. You just got to work that much harder to create value in your real estate rather than just relying on macro fundamentals right. of the capital stack. Of course. So I think it's a very apropos point. Right. And what 
What questions do buyers usually neglect to ask sellers that you think you would ask as a buyer? I think the most important question that I think some buyers will ask, but not all, um, is why are you selling? Why are you selling? Like, what's the motivation? Yeah. And who has say? Yeah. Because we've run into issues where, um, you know, working through an estate sale earlier this year that everything seemed to be, there's these two brothers who were duking it out. Yeah. And, you know, one of them had an idea of pricing in their mind that was 20, 30% lower than where this other brother brother had. And the one who had the lower pricing yeah. expectation was actually much more in line. And so they're duking it. We're selling. We're not going to sell. We're not going to sell. We are going to sell. We're not going to sell. And they're going back and forth. And then the attorney chimes in. Uh, actually, neither of you have a vote. This is an estate for your kids, right. and they're actually going to vote. And so we wasted months, yeah. these people fighting, and it was failed to be uncovered, That uh, which could be on us there. But you know, just understanding um, who has the say, of course. why are they doing it? Of course. Definitely something to consider. Um, what makes a multi-billion dollar closer like yourself? <laughs> what are the ingredients? Consistency mm -hmm. is huge. It's, um, man, I'm realizing now that I use a ton of quotes from people that I don't, I can't attribute them to, but it's, uh, it's better to be consistently good than occasionally great. Right. Right. So you can show up and be like, all right, I'm waking up at 3 a.m. every day this week. I'm going to crush it and 4,000 cold calls and you're burnt out the next okay. week. And that's not nearly as good as the person for two years shows up and does exactly what they say they're going right. to do. And that's why it really makes sense to hone in on your habits and the map of your time, mm. because you want to build something that is actually... Um, it's doable, you know? It, can you consistently stick with this right. or are you going to get burnt out? And I like to leave room to level up within the week, but I don't want to leave room where I'll miss, if that right. makes sense. So I actually prefer to have a little bit of leeway because when things are exciting, I end up leveling up and saying, oh, I was going to call 10 people and I was like, I called 20 right. in this hour. And whatever, whatever, whatever the metric is that mm -hmm. you're tracking... If you give yourself the ability to not let yourself down, for me, I find that motivating. I hit all my marks, and then I did this. Um, some people might respond better to reach goals right. where they need to do that. Uh, it's just this, you know, personal preference. So, right. just understanding yourself, whether you're more of like a realistic goal type of person or somebody that shoots for the stars, and understand makes... who you are. Put processes and systems mm -hmm. in place to take that mental bandwidth off of your plate right. so you can focus on higher functioning tasks. Be consistent and play the long game right. because you can probably make a decent amount of money in good markets or you know perhaps in upcoming markets if you specialize in distressed right. assets. Um, but you probably aren't going to be retiring in five or 10 years if you're in your 20s or 30s. Mm -hmm. So you might as well say, what do I need to do for 10 or 20 years so that the long game, the long game, right? Understood. So, and what personality traits and skill sets should, let's say, somebody's in high school, what should they work on to prepare themselves for what they're about to come against? Um, so I don't know that there's so other than the consistency and all those ones that we've talked about, um, and this is probably along the, the lines of personal branding as well. Um, I don't think there's a singular personality that wins out. Okay, uh, if you're an a hole. That's probably not a good thing, but there might be somebody out there that loves to work with a-holes. Right. There's generally somebody for everyone. Everyone. Yeah. There are some personalities that are probably like the base of a tree and, and the trunk of a tree that you know have a little bit more reach. Right. So it does help to be nice and outgoing. And you know, I was at an event with Ryan Serhan who was talking about, do you know that I practice smiling while talking so that I'm more <laughs> likable? I'm like, you're super likable. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. So he taught, he thinks about his presentation and does that draw people in? He was on TV. Of course he did. Like it, right. it, it, it was practiced. For me, an example that comes to mind is how do you present yourself? And um, this is probably going to be a lesson for myself. I'll mm -hmm. have to watch this because I, I don't think I ever have. But I had somebody that worked for me who uh, was fairly young, you know, younger than 25, and he was quintessential like frat bro. Mm. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. He was pretty smart kid and and added a lot of value but his presentation always was 
very lackadaisical. Yo, bro, like I did this under <laughs> I'm like you have intelligent things to add to this conversation, but nobody can cut through your presentation. Right. So it's almost like how you say it is half of what you're saying. Yeah. You know, it, it, and so I would say that practice your presentate your outward presentation. Be true to yourself because you will it'll get caught up with you yeah. if you are a you know a BS artist of your own personality. Like right. you do have to be true to that, but that doesn't mean you can't emphasize certain traits when you're out drinking with your boys. Sure. And then if you're in a conference room presenting, you might want to be a little bit more tied up yeah. and speak clearly and thoughtfully and use the correct vocabulary. And um, so, yeah, I think how you present yourself, I mean, if you're putting yourself out there, that's what people are consuming. So right. just think about how people are perceiving you. Understood. And let's say someone watching this wants to do their own thing in real estate whether that be opening their own brokerage shop or acquisition firm or whatever it is, would you recommend for them to work at a big shop like CBRE or JLL or Avis and Young or start their own firm directly out of college and learn as they go? It seems like it would be really hard to do it on your own. Mm. Um, I love the entrepreneurial spirit of somebody wanting to take that yeah. on. Uh, it also probably requires uh, some familial money or something. Um, brokerage is hard as it is even on good teams uh, with shared commissions, still doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. So if you're a billionaire's kid and a lot of time to, to waste, sure, give it a shot. But I don't think it's going to work out that well. Okay, so the true answer is yes. You got you to gotta start on a team right. because it shortens that learning curve for you. As we keep talking about how much experience can you fit into the shortest amount of time? And if you're out there... You'll get really good at cold calling mm -hmm. and you'll get really good at not internalizing the word no, yeah. but you're not going to get that good at underwriting because nobody's there to oh, show you why Walking that through, doesn't yeah. work. You're not going to get that good at contract negotiation because mm -hmm. you're not going to have any deals to negotiate. Yeah. So it's just, it's a matter of putting yourself in front of where can you speed up your learning process the best. Right. So I don't know why you would ever do it alone because that'd be a very short-sighted way of tackling a long-term goal. Now, do I I do think there's a point in time where if you want to be entrepreneurial, like you feel like you have the right skill set, mm -hmm. maybe you do stretch and you go out sooner than before you know everything. Right. But you, you you should have a foundation where you at least know when you're starting your new company day one, okay, these are the 10 things we have to know how to do. Let's yeah. put the checklist together at least. You know, that's a baseline. Of course. Yeah, understood. And uh, how do you go about setting goals for yourself and for your company? Uh, all of our goals start at the individual level mm. uh, and then roll up into team level. Right. And I think it's best to start with short-term goals mm. that extend into long-term goals, uh, which is not the way that everybody does it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I want to do this work in backwards. five years, yeah. how can I get there? I understand that going back to life design, what am I willing to suffer today? Right. In, and that'll show you what you can have later yep. is the way that I tend to look at it. And so if I'm willing to commit 60 hours a week to my job and I'm willing to write down these 10 or 12 different things I need to do every week mm -hmm. and never miss ever and always give up my weekend. Like you can accomplish a lot, yeah. but you better figure out the time. Like, I don't think people understand the time that it takes to do things often. And, um, and so I think starting with a good time map of what you can actually accomplish mm -hmm. in an hour mm -hmm. and then fitting in the different activities you need to do those hours, leaving a little bit of room because stuff comes up. Right. That is a good way to come up with a realistic goal. And maybe as you get more efficient at things, you can start to ratchet things up. And so your longer term goals can get ratcheted up. Mm. But I, I would hate to tell you, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a billionaire in five years. How? Well, I'm just gonna keep going to work and you right. know, hope it hope it works out. I'm gonna do 10% more every day. I don't I don't I just don't understand how I that would happen. Yeah. So uh I prefer to to control what I can control and uh, enjoy the ride. Understood. Perfect. Um, what has been the most difficult point in your career and how did that shape you as an individual from that point on? I've had a number of difficult times in my career. 
Um, some of them exciting and difficult, some of them personally difficult, which carried over into work. Mm -hmm. um, so big, like, I'll, start, I'll just start with a, with a couple of them. So when I went from CB to AY, uh, CB, institutional product, office buildings, uh, some multi, some retail, like power centers, come join a boutique team in New York that specializes in complex development, yeah. like ground leases with tax credits and inclusionary housing and all these things. And I didn't know what any of those things you took meant. A leap. Mm -hmm. Not even one of them. They said, oh, he's on that team. He must be smart enough to be on our team. Right. So that, that was like the whole interview. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hopefully I am. And I showed up and they're like, okay, so we have this presentation tomorrow or in two days with a fairly well-known developer. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure you, the underwriting's tight. And I open up the previous analyst model and I start, and I don't even know where to find information. Right. I don't have a Rianomi or a Property Shark set up yet. And I don't understand how 421A works. And I don't understand what inclusionary housing means or how it's generated. So you were thrown into the fire? Thrown into the fire completely. And I had an absolute panic attack. Right. And and I leaned into it and I don't, I don't remember. It turned out okay. And I, I swear I blacked out this mm. whole experience because I don't remember how I got to a good deliverable, but I did. Right. Um, separately, you know, when, when we were recreating the Tri-State Investment Sales Group, or I guess at the initial creation of it five years ago now, mm -hmm. it was a scary times because it was like we had our group at AY. We had this James Nelson group coming in with 10 or 15 people. We had Kinsey Capital coming mm -hmm. in. We had a few different teams all joining. And as somebody who really cares about the culture and how people work together, it was very nerve wracking mm -hmm. to see how that was going to come together. And uh, no roles were defined at that time. Everybody was just like a, a flat structure. Right. And it's like, okay, like, let's start to figure this out. And that's kind of when I just started raising my hand. Uh, I actually know how to do all the analytics. I, oh, I know how the marketing works. Oh, I know what technologies are. It was because in the first five years at AY, I was taking my time to learn yeah. all these different things. And so when these other people show up, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm the guy Specific for... Specific knowledge, yeah. It turned out to be like, how do you... And the, I'll do it, guys. Like, And so it became where and that's how I got my like my Great. director of operations yeah. roles. Like, I knew how all of the things had worked in that sense. And so the lesson from both of those was like lean into those difficulties and really like embrace those challenges. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about seasons of life and yeah. when you can spend time with your family, when you can't, like you just say, hey, we got this big thing happening. Expect less of me for two months and hopefully you have a good partner or you yeah. have a whatever it is that allows you to do that. And my wife has always been great about that. I'd just tell her like two weeks coming up, not going to be good. I won't change any diapers. I won't be home for dinner mm -hmm. any nights. It's going to be a lot. And then there's times it's like, hey, I know you probably have a lot going on at work. I'm waking up Carmen and I'm putting her to bed every single night. And right. I love that. So knowing when you can push, when you can't push. Um, and then uh, the last one that I do want to touch on is um, last year, our other business partner, Jim Kinsey, died. And he was really the mentor mm -hmm. for me of the mm -hmm. group. And he's 12 years older than me, but a really close friend. And um, and it was the first time that something like that had had, like even in, in, in or outside of the work, I've been so fortunate where, you know, the people that I had lost in my, in my life um, it, it, as an adult were like my grandparents, which is obviously sad, but you see it coming. Mm -hmm. And the impermanence that, impermanence lesson that it gave me was really a moment to just like stop and appreciate mm -hmm. my family and things like that. Cause you could, you don't know, you know, if today's your last day. And mm. so while I do think long term, I'll never not spend the time with my family or whatever it is because I could get hit by a bus on right. my bike ride home tonight. And right. I just, you never know. Yeah. Um, and who were your role models and people you looked up to when you're coming up in the industry? You mentioned Jim. Jim was your mentor. Um, I only knew Jim for four years. Mm. But it was a very impactful four years. Uh, he was a Buddhist. And the same way that I talk about somebody who feels a lot of emotions, mm -hmm. like I can, I can get hot. Like I, I, I try not to, I'm not like a blow up person, right. but like I'll internalize that stuff. He was always calm, cool, collected. Mm -hmm. Nothing could phase this guy. Uh, he, he was just always knew the right human aspect to everything. Right. And so there's probably people who knew the, Bricks better than he was absolutely an expert in you know real estate as an asset class, but 
he was even more an expert in dealing with people. Mm. And so the master class that I got from him in that sense uh, is just uh, is what really made him a masterful mm. uh, deal maker and a masterful manager yep. and just so a, a great person to have around. Okay. Um, and what's your perspective on networking? What value can a young professional provide for you so that you're more inclined to hire them or offer them advice or whatever it is? I don't know that I, I don't know that I ever look for people less established than me to come in and add value unless they work for me. Right. Um, I might work for you one day. I have no idea, but you seem nice enough <laughs> and, uh, I have no reason not to like you or try to help you out in some way. Right. So I'll always, always is a strong word. I will most always take the time to have the intro conversation right. with somebody, grab the coffee, introduce them to somebody. Uh, today I introduced an analyst candidate to um, an investor that mm. I've actually never bought or sold anything with, but I know, you know they're good people. And I said, this would be a good match. Mm. And I was happy to make that introduction mm. and, and do that for the young person. Um, you don't know. And I mean, even networking with other brokers, like that's people move, right? People change jobs. People start their own shops. Right. So like they could be my top investor one day. And so I'm not going to treat that person poorly. Um, because one, I don't think that's a nice thing to do. And right. I want to be a decent human being. And two, you have no idea what, who they know and what value they might add back in your life one day. What goes around comes around. Exactly. Yeah. They could, they could be best friends with somebody that I'm about to get signed up the listing right. on. And they're like, you ever run into this guy, Eric? Yeah. You know, you know what he said to me? He was such a jerk. And then I don't get signed. Like right. I do, I would never leave anything open for that to even be considered. So just do the right thing and treat people well. And I think it comes, up, comes 100%, back around. hundred percent. And what do you look for in a new hire? Um, so hard work is going to stand out. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, so I would like to know that somebody's willing to work hard because they probably can't add a ton of value. Right. The first, it changes first three to six months. I'm adding value to them. And then they start adding value right. back because there's, even if they come in with some, some background, it's usually a lot of training, how we do things, right. all these, there's a lot of training that goes into people. Um, so what I really look for is decent resume is fine, but they, and I've hired over 60 people in the last five years. And for each one of those successful hires, it could have been up to like 20 interviewee candidates. Mm. So it's a lot of hiring that I've had to do. And um, when you're with somebody for as many hours as you're going to be, you better get along with them. Right. Okay. And I get along with most people, but there are certain people that just don't communicate in a way that is conducive to like a team environment. Right. Um, we've had to fire people who would not communicate on a team, on a unified team, mm -hmm. you cannot withhold information. You know, if it's super sensitive, you don't need to broadcast right. it, but you don't do something that's counter to the team goals. So just being somebody that can do attitude, hardworking, decent to be around, good communicator. If we're talking personal brand, how are you bringing yourself mm -hmm. here? Uh, those are all things that I would be, be looking for, but I'm not going to be you know, asking somebody to, to add value. But when you talk about networking, this is a good good spot to do the shame, shameless plug here. Um, I'm co-chair of a group called Real Estate Ascending Leaders. Right. And we are a group for, uh, I'll call it the deal side of the business. Mm -hmm. So acquisitions, developers, investment sales, debt professionals, you know, capital markets right. types roles. What we don't have is uh, attorneys, architects, title, and so it's great for them to sponsor our events, but uh, it also means that you get a really organic conversation around how deals come together. Right. And we have people who are, you know, 22 fresh out of school and people who are 38, 40 years old who've done a ton of deals. Mm -hmm. And so it, it offers a good opportunity for the older mid-career people to discuss kind of higher level how these transactions really came together that a 2020 year old right. is Doesn't not even going to mean yeah. anything to them probably. Um, but it offers that mentoring ability as well. So I would encourage people to either reach out to me or 
uh, check out real-ny.org. Great. Um, I'll put the link in the description part for the video. Um, and what's your favorite question to ask in an interview to kind of gauge <laughs> where someone's at? Um, oh, God. I don't do any of those uh, weird interview questions, like how many baseballs are in Yankee Stadium <laughs> or something like that. Uh, mostly because I don't know how I would figure that yeah. out. You know, we're not Google over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I think this is going to be a pass. I don't have any creative questions to ask. Okay. I, I like to... I like to spend some time getting to know that person. Uh, I think just tell me about yourself is pretty telling, like because that gives somebody the opportunity to highlight what mm -hmm. they think is important about them. And when somebody likes to really hone in on certain aspects of their life or their skill set, right. that's what they're most proud of. Or conversely, perhaps like they're Not trying to downplay right. something. Yeah. And so it's just a, it's an interesting view into their psyche. Hundred percent. And. Um, so what, what real estate asset classes or property types do you see potential for in the coming decade? Let's see. What are the stock answers here? Uh, multifamily, industrial seem to be the ones. Um, but the word potential yeah. is, is going to put me on the other end of that spectrum, mm -hmm. which is going to be that office. office. Yeah. So suburban office, class BC office in the mm -hmm. city. The potential needs to be unlocked. Yep which is going to require zoning oh, relief, yeah. fire department relief, probably a 421G because yeah. the basis of these buildings haven't traded at a level that enable them, aside from uh, the great success that Nathan yeah. Berman has had downtown with a number of different partners. Um, and so when we have a housing shortage that's projected to be 530,000 units by 2030, and we have uh, 100 million square feet of empty office, office buildings, space, yeah. it seems like a good fit. Unfortunately, politics are a thing, and oftentimes perception is heralded over looking at actual figures, numbers, right. what, what can drive city revenue. So um, I won't touch politics. That's the third rail here. But I do think office would be the greatest potential if somebody could figure out how what, to the, do with it. what to do with it. Great. Okay. Uh, and what books would you recommend to a young professional starting out as a blank slate in commercial real estate um, that you've read and that helped you? <laughs> um, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits <laughs> is good because it'll, you know, get your get yourself in order, get your house in right. order, because that's what's really going to yeah. power you to, um, to be successful at work. So the less chaos you have at home, right. the better you're going to be at work. Um, I think my partner would kill me if I didn't mention that he has a book coming out. James Nelson, right. James Nelson, yeah, The Insider's Edge to Commercial yep. Real Estate. So you can find that at jamesnelson.com or jamesnelsonnyc.com. Right. Yep. I'm sorry, I don't know your website, James. Um, or you can reach out to me. I'll put the link in the description yeah, as well. that would be great. Um, there are some other, like, I guess, like, self-help type category books. Like, I just read Adam Grant's... Um, I think again. I don't even remember. Just always examining how and why you do things. I think there's a, it's a good space to, it's a good way to just keep yourself honest. Right. You know, one takeaway there, and this was another LinkedIn post that I had out there, which was, um, you know, there's leaders who are so convicted in what, because they've had so much success, they're unwilling to look at other ways of doing yep. things. And I find that, if you have a bunch of success, you should actually be always looking for contradicting arguments right. for what, because one, you'll either learn that there's some holes in your argument, or two, you'll feel even more convicted because yeah. you realize you know better than the other argument after really understanding and learning that point of view. So I think always looking for that other point of view is is just a, a way to keep yourself honest. Right. You think it's always important to not live in like an echo chamber where only your own uh self-confirming beliefs are existing. You said it better than I did. <laughs> Great. It. Um, and how does, how does creativity play a role in real estate brokerage? Can you think back to a time where you chose to think differently and came up with an out of the box solution to a problem that your client has had? Yeah. Oh, here's a, here's a difficult one. So we're uh, institution in the city. Most of their wealth is tied up in this single asset and they're mm -hmm. insolvent. And they're going, they're in some serious trouble here. Mm. Um, I'm trying to remember, this was a, a couple of years ago, and I can't remember what the exact trigger was, but they had a, a two week period 
to um, repay some debt. And so we were able to, and they wanted us to sell this building for them so that they could cash out, pay mm -hmm. that off, and, and then they're good to go, right? Unfortunately, you can't sell a building in two weeks unless it's at a steep discount because right. that means somebody's stepping in with no idea about due diligence and capitalizing it that fast. Yeah. Like that's pretty pretty tough. So what we did is we brought in our debt team, and they they were able to in ten days they were able to close a loan for them, take out that other loan, give them enough funds to float the operations mm. of this institution for uh, six months which was what we had targeted as enough time to actually get the transaction done. Awesome. That's yeah. great. And what drives you nowadays? Is it money, personal achievement, family, philanthropy? And when would you say you've succeeded? Um, so I think this is really tough for me because I, I, I'm always thinking about this. Well, not always, but I do think about this a lot in that when I have reached certain levels of success, um, it's not, there's no like, awesome, I did it, right. I'm done. It's like, what's the next step? What's the next step? And so there's a fine line between having goals to achieve and feeling proud of them and yeah. building self-efficacy, which I think that's what they're really good at. Like, if you were to just stop and have some gratitude and be like, the person five years ago, if they were to see where you are yeah. now, they'd be like, Nice. But the person today is like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't get that last deal. Like, I'm such a failure. Right. And so having the humility and the gratitude to take a look at what you've done is a huge part of it. But I, you know, health is wealth. Mm. So I, because I've been times where I can't feel my left leg because my back is so bad. Mm. Right. And that's not a good place to be. So when you don't have your health, you can't think about anything else. So I hope to remain very healthy and plan to keep, you know, good, consistent habits in that. Hope to grow my family, which has been an amazing part of life uh, in, the, in this past year. And I hope to have a strong business that continues to involve with the marketplace that's able to, you know, solve problems right. in distressed times, but also is you know, able to capitalize on the strong times, able to continually bring in new technologies that take human elements out of things so that you can focus on higher, higher return tasks. And, um, you know, I, I'm really around, I'm really looking to just build a, a good life here in a lot of different ways. And the, the four burner theory, you can't have health and, and your family and your social life right. and, and your business success all at once. And there's times when some of those burners need to be turned up, but I'll, I'll never be the guy that turns one of them off. Right. Um, I, I, I do want it all. And so, um, so I'll feel content if I do get hit by the bus at, a, at any point, because I know I'm giving all those my all. Understood. And I have my last question to wrap it up. Cool. Uh, what advice would you give your 22 year old self about life, business and relationships? Gosh, I don't know what I could say that I haven't already said, uh, a number of times. I'll just say this. Uh, you'll spend probably, I think the stat is like 85, 90% of the time you'll ever spend with your parents by the time you're 18 and move out of their house. Yeah. Call your mom. <laughs> Tell her you love her. we Will do. <laughs> Great. Eric, this has been amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that young professionals watching this will get some value from it and apply it to their careers moving forward. Awesome. And I'll go ahead and drop all the links down in the description below. Thanks for having me. Great. Amazing.